if we would be in a formal sitting, in a sense I would propose that we all stand and uh, we pay one minute silence uh, as a tribute for all the people who have died and are dying over the past weeks, the current weeks, for such a terrible winter conditions uh, in uh, European streets. Of course, we won't do that, and unfortunately, nobody probably in uh, any European institutions or national institution would do that, because uh, we are not used to remember and to pay sufficient attention, including uh, formal, official attention, to homeless people and uh, people who are excluded. Uh, it is just enough to think to the topic that with Fianza and Eurodiaconia we have picked up for this afternoon uh, initiative. It is a seminar on citizenship, and citizenship it is uh, a well-established concept in the European Union. It is actually the heart of the European Union project and our integration. Freedom of movement, which is one of the fundamental um, of the fundamental uh, value and principle that every European citizen should uh, should enjoy and actually enjoys by a large extent, and then homeless people. And actually homeless people, they don't fit with the two first concept. Citizenship, fine. Circulation, fine. But the homeless people are somewhere else. Well, I think we have a, a basic denial of all this kind of concept uh, for so many people living either citizens or not citizens uh, of the European Union in uh, our uh, EU uh, uh, territory. Uh, we deny the very often formal citizenship to migrants, but even to EU citizens, we denied active participation in what should be concrete forms of enjoy European uh, or national citizenship. And we denied freedom of circulation, we denied access to basic services, including emergency services, and as it has been denounced by the press conference we just had uh, before, sometimes even access to basic shelter in uh, some of the EU uh, member states, uh, including for people who are citizens of another European Union, uh, Union country. The basic feeling is that nobody wants them. Nobody wants really to deal with them. They are undesired people, and we hope, and when I say we, I talk about our society and our institutions, we hope that somebody else will actually take care of, uh, of them. Nevertheless, the people we are talking about are there, they are very visible, and there are more and more. Uh, recently, talking about my own country, the Italian bank, Central Bank, published two weeks ago an interesting survey, arguing that the street people are a phenomena increasing in my country, and uh, almost 20% uh, of those people, if I will remember 21% of these people, they are actually coming from the middle class. So it is uh, an erosion of uh, social benefits and uh, social standards that we are looking at. And this is actually the story of all European countries. Eurostat also has an extremely impressive uh, uh, and dramatic uh, data about, uh, about that. What we can do and what we shall do here in the European Parliament in order to try to address, uh, uh, address uh, this issue. Well. First of all, I think that it is very important that uh, initiatives such as the one uh, uh, um, of this afternoon, which is actually the follow-up or also other initiative, one we had uh, in, uh, in Florence, in Italy, uh, last year, 
and there have been others in uh, different uh, EU member states. It is very important those initiatives are hosted by the European Parliament. It is important that this kind of institutions open its door to discuss and to raise this kind of issue. As a matter of fact, there is very little connections between the political arena on one side and the urban poverty and the street people on the other side. This is an issue that we flag a few times in the past. As politicians, we are used to have contacts with all kinds of professional categories, all kinds of social sectors, students, disabled, uh, unemployment, including vulnerable sectors, but basically there is very little connections between the political field on one side and the street people phenomena on the other side. And the reason is very simple. Street people, they don't form a constituency. They don't go to vote. They don't create, by large extent, electoral consensus. And so they have a <coughs> relatively small weight in the political decision. And it is important that these places, which this kind of buildings is supposed to be the house of all European citizens, is also the house of uh, European street people and all people who live in Europe, also if they're not, if they're not European uh, citizens as such. We have a problem in terms of legal basis to act at European Union level because fight against urban poverty and uh, uh, social policies are mostly policies which are given to the member states and not really to the European Union. But this is not, should not be an excuse for not acting at European level because uh, we are in positions to provide guidelines, to be much more aware of the problem, to exchange uh, good practices, best practices that do exist uh, in, uh, in member states. We uh, managed to have uh, already uh, two debates in plenary in the European Parliament and two important votes on the social exclusion, anti-social exclusion strategy in the European Union last, uh, last uh, uh, September and then last November on another important vote on how to fight, uh, uh, how to tackle the issue uh, specifically of uh, street people in Europe. And uh, uh, the two texts that we did uh, adopt uh, are full of recommendation of good initiatives, good ideas uh, uh, that uh, uh, provide a number of guidelines and uh, policies to be implemented in the European Union. And I think it was very important to have those debates in plenary because um, that means that we could formally, institutionally engage also with the European Commission and with the other EU institutions on a topic which is always or often dismissed in, uh, in, uh, in Brussels. Uh, recently, FAO has published a report which also uh, provides a number of interesting data about waste food. Every European citizen is estimated to produce 179 kilos of food on a year basis, which is wasted, which is not used, which is thrown away. Uh, a country like Italy, uh, with the waste food uh, which uh, uh, is supposed to is uh, uh, it produced every year, could satisfy the needs of a country such as Spain, and the other way around. It is a pan-European issue. The European Parliament decided to make 2014 the year to tackle the issue of waste food, which is a huge scandal because to produce waste food, it is also a waste of energy, of water, of electricity, of transport, for nothing because then, of, of course, uh, productions of waste then needs to be properly processed and, and, and so on. Uh, but that is uh, an interesting uh, uh, track because there is a room for maneuvering, room for improving, room for getting additional resources, additional food, but also additional financial resources uh, for addressing the issue of poverty if we simply manage to have a much more rational society with much more structured uh, schemes uh, which reduce uh, the productions of uh, waste, uh, of waste uh, uh, food. Uh, a lot of good ideas, 
a lot of initiative, but I'm not sure Europe is really heading uh, on the right directions. If we simply think, simple think to what's happening in Hungary, which is at the heart of Europe, situation in Hungary it has been hugely debated and is going to be hugely debated again, of course, in European Parliament. Uh, the new law uh, in Hungary about uh, street people, it is uh, a shame. I think most of you are well informed that uh, a fine of 445 euros is uh, uh, given to uh, people who live in the street, who sleep in the street. Uh, the alternative is to go to, to, to jail. There is a, a clear, uh, open, transparent criminalization of, uh, of street people. European Commission has taken up this issue, of course, and it is part of, the, of all the uh, anti counter recommendations to the new government in, in Hungary. But I have to say that even if the European Commission, rightly so, have taken up this issue, when we, we read the list of uh, threats to fundamental values uh, uh, that are created by the new law in, in Hungary, we have media, we have uh, churches, we have the judges, we have uh, 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 citizenship, we have minorities. At the very end of our list <laughs> comes the, the threat uh, to street people and these uh, awful uh, provisions that find them uh, in such a criminal, uh, criminal, uh, criminal way. Uh, well, what uh, we have to do, I think, first of all, we should try to have uh, the Parliament and the Commission, and in particular the Commission, because it is much more in its mandate, to monitoring the situation of uh, street people in Europe. It is a social phenomenon which is there, which is growing. I uh, re reminded in the press conference that I recently witnessed, actually twice, in downtown in Paris last October, street people, Rue Saint-Antoine, uh, with children. So a phenomena in a sense that it was relatively new because children living in the street, it is something that years ago was much less common in uh, uh, at least major European, uh, European capitals. And European Commission should actually monitor and should mapping what is actually happening. We have no figures, we don't have a real, uh, a real picture in order to uh, describe uh, the phenomena. Uh, which is still very, very uh, visible. Secondly, we should have a, a clarification of the legislation, of the current legislation, particularly on the issue of uh, freedom of movement. Uh, some member states argue that there are provisions entitle them to stop providing or to deny providing basic services to EU citizens hosted in, 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 in their territory. Uh, some argue that uh, the legislation actually uh, is contradictory to the EU principle. I think that an initiative uh, from the Commission to clarify this basic assumption will be, will be uh, helpful. Uh, third, I think there is uh, a number of basic rights that should be very clearly stated by European Union institutions, including, of course, right to access to basic health, to emergency health, and to a shelter. That should be, and other rights, fundamental rights, that should be uh, clearly given with no uh, uh, barrier whatsoever in any uh, EU member states. Uh, and I would end in saying that eventually what we are talking about, it's not just a major social issue. It is not just uh, uh, what is the matter of uh, uh, daily commitment, daily engagement for so many European volunteers. Here we have so many representatives from different associations engaging every day. And the second session, actually the first session of our, of our debate, will actually be on experience from practice. And we are extremely grateful, I think, as institutional representatives to the work that you all do. Uh, but what we are talking about, it's a, a very uh, fundamental uh, matter of European identity. Uh, if Europe should be um, the house of a number of principles and uh, 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 different from uh, uh, other uh, world uh, regions and world experience, I think is this because issues such as uh, po urban poverty should become 
uh, a matter of priority for us, for uh, the kind of uh, society that we want to shape up. So many thanks for being here. And uh, I give now the floor, I think it is, uh, to, yes, to Ed Roy uh, from Euro uh, Diaconia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank um, Nicola Rinaldi uh, for hosting this seminar this afternoon and helping us organise it. As, as somebody said in the, in the press conference, it's a courageous move to host a seminar on an issue that is perhaps not yet recognised widely enough in Europe. And um, it's very important to us and Fianza that you're willing to give this uh, matter your attention and support us as we try to bring it to the attention of a wider audience. So perhaps I, I, I could start with why we're here. Well, Eurodiaconia is a Europe-wide network of practitioners, service providers and advocates in fact, we are a network of organisations who have day-to-day -day contact with thousands of vulnerable people across Europe. Our 36 members in 23 countries are motivated by Christian values and identity and seek to serve and provide a Christian response to concrete challenges faced by individuals, families and society as a whole. Our members seek to support by fostering independence, responsibility, providing freedom of choice in the support that they offer, and their knowledge, and our knowledge as a European network, is based on the day-to-day -day experience of our members in providing a mix of long-standing and innovative services for people experiencing, among other things, extreme destitution and homelessness. At the heart of our work across Europe is the inherent belief in a dignified living situation for all people, regardless of origin or of their life story. This belief in a dignified life is not just a Christian response, but a response based on human rights. And it's the fundamental starting point for the debate on social inclusion in Europe today. As a Europe-wide network, we can see at first hand the rising phenomena of exclusion and poverty. It is not decreasing in Europe as much as we might like to think it should. Since 2008, our members are increasingly reporting a new crisis which finds its roots in one of Europe's highest achievements, that of freedom of movement. Freedom of movement is herald, heralded, maybe rightly so, as the success of the European Union and a key element in the development of the internal market. It's inherent in many EU policies and indeed the Europe 2020 strategy, the current guiding vision, if you like, for the European Union. In that strategy, free movement is stated as a means by which to develop our labour markets and ensure economic growth. Free movement, of course, is not a new phenomenon, but the last years have seen huge changes in Europe, and more and more EU citizens are exercising their right to free movement as laid down in the treaties, particularly from east to west. Such mobility is often the result of poor socio-economic conditions, both from before and as a result of the economic and financial crisis. And the desire, therefore, is to search for a better life. <coughs> for many, such migration is successful, but for an increasing number, it is not. Precari precarious, low quality and undeclared employment can all lead to destitution for many intra-EU migrants as residency and often access to basic social and health assistance is conditional in many member states on either being in employment or financially self-supporting. People who find themselves out of work and in another EU country risk falling through the gaps in our social protection systems and ending up in destitution. In Eurodiaconia, our members know this. Every day they are faced with the consequences of intra-EU migration gone wrong. They see how people may not wish to formally request social support in case they lose their permission to stay in a country. They see how existing psychosocial conditions can be worsened by destitution and isolation. They see how a lack of knowledge on social rights and how to ask, access them leaves people at risk. They see how separation from family and other support networks can lead into a spiral of vulnerability. 
They also see how increasingly it's the expectation that NGOs and other civil society actors will take care of those experiencing destitution, yet the funding available to support such services is decreasing. Our members see how many member states think that sending people home will solve the problem without ensuring that appropriate reconnections are made and that appropriate inclusion measures are available to ensure that the same situation of destitution is not repeated when in the home country. Our members see the paradox, indeed perhaps the hypocrisy, of a European Union that promotes free movement to enhance growth and productivity, but which is not willing to care and support people when employment in another country ends and when destitution begins. Are we really a European Union that only cares for people if they are productive? Are we really a European Union that does not recognise that just as free movement brings rights and responsibilities to the individual EU citizen, it also brings rights and responsibilities to member states who are ultimately benefiting from free movement and therefore should care for those resident in their country? As Mr Rinaldi said, there is a lack of clarity in Europe about this issue. Legislation is uncertain. Interpretation of residence rights are still unclear, especially for people lacking a formal income. Additionally, access to emergency support and accommodation, as well as access to social welfare benefits, vary according to each member state. But we also have a commitment to fundamental rights enshrined in the Treaty of Lisbon, that should enable us to deal with this lack of clarity. If we're to be a Europe that lives up to a treaty commitment to combat social exclusion and discrimination and promote social justice, then there must be a willingness to address this issue at European level and not allow member states to hide behind the notion of unreasonable burden on social assistance schemes. So how do we move forward? Well, I think this afternoon the most important thing is to listen to the practitioners that we have here. They will give you practical suggestions and they'll give you some political suggestions. And it's important that we listen to those with clear experience. But it's also clear that the European Union must take the responsibility to support member states in dealing with a European challenge of European destitution as a result of European freedom of movement. There are a number of actions that can be taken. Particularly, most importantly, is for the EU to find a way to guarantee that all EU citizens have at least access to emergency accommodation and support. This right is enshrined in our treaties. And additionally, support should be given to NGOs and other actors to provide such services. There's also a need to clarify this concept of unreasonable burden on social assistance schemes. To be clear what criteria is meant when we say that people are burdens in our society. Thirdly, there could be the possibility to look at the portability of social protection schemes between member states. We already have it with healthcare to some extent, why not with social protection? And the EU could also encourage partnership between member states to work together to ensure that return to the home country is a positive experience and not one that prolongs destitution and exclusion. And finally, the EU could provide member states with needed support to cope with the pressures of meeting changes in demand to the provision of emergency social and health services. Perhaps I finish by saying that our collective goal as a European Union should be to ensure that no one EU citizen or not, faces destitution. And in this particular context today, we want to draw attention to those who experience destitution as a result of ex exercising his or her right to free movement. We want the European Parliament to promote the need for clearer rules and responses on free movement and destitution and use its voice to lead the call that no EU citizen lives in destitution or exclusion. A European level response is necessary and we need the European Parliament to lead the way to convince the Council and the European Commission to bring this to the top of the political agenda. As has been noted, the European Parliament has already led the way on homelessness generally. 
Now is the time to look at destitution and free movement. Your Diaconia's members will not stop to continue to care for those who are the margins of society. But we don't want to just care, but to challenge the systems that create destitution in the first place. And we want to work in partnership with the European Parliament, with FIANSA and others, to address the root causes as well as provide the care. Thank you. I'll keep my uh, presentation very short also uh, because we, of course, agree with what uh, Heather has just said uh, and also because we're running a little bit behind uh, uh, time and I think it's important to hear the uh, uh, practitioners um, uh, later on. And also I come back to make the conclusion so I have a chance to uh, speak. But I still want to um, take two or three of your uh, 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 minutes. Mr. Rinaldi and Heather also um, said that the European Parliament has already been quite active on the uh, issue of homelessness, and it's important to repeat it uh, here. Um, the European Parliament has accepted two written declarations. Um, one of these written declarations actually called upon the EU to commit itself to make sure that nobody is forced to sleep rough because of lack of services adapted to their needs, and this before the end of 2015. Well, I think it's important and very um, uh, relevant to um, uh, repeat that uh, here. But maybe even more important, the European Parliament voted um, in September last year with an overwhelming majority. If I would exclude the anti-European parties and the racist political parties, it was actually unanimity, almost, um, voted the resolution to call for an EU strategy on homelessness. Um, I see that um, there is a representative from the Commission here uh, I think that um, coal cannot be ignored, and I am happy to hear from Yonut Sasu later on how far the European Commission is with the development of that strategy. That to just congratulate the Parliament with um, their courage to um, bring this issue of homelessness on the agenda. Now, a few words on the issue of the, the theme of this um, uh, 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 small seminar, uh, destitution and uh, free movement. I mean, Heather already said a lot, but I just want to emphasize how the problem of EU citizens being homeless in other EU countries has increased quite dramatically over the last couple of years, especially in a number uh, of countries. I mean, the internal migration is especially east-west, but not only east-west. Um, uh, I mean, we don't have any... Um, reliable figures, but what we hear from our members who provide services, who run shelters for homeless people, is that the increase is substantial. Just to give you one number, um, in a city like London, for instance, if you look at rough sleepers, um, almost half of the rough sleepers these days in London are actually EU citizens from other countries. Um, so it's not a massive number of people, but it's an important issue that can be addressed um, at uh, EU uh, level. Heather said earlier that there is some unclarity around the free movement legislation at EU level. That's certainly true. I mean, concepts have to be clarified. I mean, to start with the concept of a worker, for instance, I mean, it's still not entirely clear what is a worker. I wonder if um, people that are forced into the informal labor market, which is often the case for people that end up in destitution, would be considered workers uh, or not. Um, but apart from the clarity that is needed, I think there is a fundamental ethical flaw in the EU free movement uh, legislation at the moment. A country like Denmark, and um, uh, let's accuse the former government and not the current um, government, but the former government decided to um, forbid publicly funded shelters to take on EU citizens that lost their protected status. I find it, and Fianza, I think Eurodiakoni as well, find it absolutely unacceptable that such a measure is possible in the European Union of today. I mean, if um, we want to prevent that from happening in the future, I don't think that we have to count on the goodwill of the different governments, but we just have to make it legally impossible for countries to 
refuse access to emergency social care for EU uh, citizens that have not uh, protected uh, status. Last thing that I want to say is in relation to um, uh, the return. We know from surveys that the people, EU citizens, that are destitute in another EU, uh, EU uh, country, that most of them, the big majority, doesn't want to go home in spite of the destitution. So I think we have to take that into account and find the solution in the country that is hosting them by helping them to find work and accommodation. But for some of them, the return home will be uh, the solution. But if that's the case, it has to happen in a transparent and well-organized way. What we see at the moment in the European Union is that local authorities are seeking help from NGOs in Eastern European countries to bring back the countries, the people to their host countries. But I don't think it's a healthy situation that public authorities are working together with only NGOs without a general framework that is established. And I think that it's the role of the European Union to make sure that such a framework exists um, so that there is no chances for abuse of this kind of um, uh, situation. I mean, I can, go back into, uh, I can go back into detail if you wish in the discussion. But these are the points that I would like to highlight. And now let's go and listen to the practice. No? Oh, sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Frick. So now this session is over. Uh, I uh, would like uh, Heather to chair the next session because I will have to leave uh, for uh, uh, sometimes for another, another meeting and apologize with my good friends Jerome and Isabella because I, I'm afraid I won't be uh, present during your presentation. But now we will have the opportunity to to listen actually from uh, the people who are carrying out the, the actual work on, uh, on, on Europe on behalf of uh, everybody, so, so to say, and taking the burden of uh, such uh, uh, a difficult, critical uh, um, uh, problem in our, in our society. So Girolamo Grammatico coming from La Casa di Cartone. Uh, you have the floor. Grazie. Thank you very much. And good evening. I would like to say thank you to Mr. Rinaldi for having me invited here. We are very small reality. I have, uh, I will expose two different levels, two parts of my discussion. In the first part, I will tell you what we are doing. And in the second part, I will tell you why we have uh, chosen these two projects, which are very important for our help for homeless people. I will try to be very concise, but I have a very important message that uh, La Casa di Cartone wants to give to people. I'm here as the representative of the Casa di Cartone, but in reality, I am... Um, bringing forward a very important work that we are carrying out in Rome. La Casa di Roma works in a network with about other 13 associations, and we have the same main message, and I will try to be the representative for this message. La Casa di Cartone has two main projects that have two different target groups. The first is called BIP, for, um, main basic um, uh, support. So first I will tell you what we're doing and then I will explain to you the details. We bring art into the emergency structures. I mean in a territorial sense. We want to connect the homeless people with the territory in which they live through those artistic dynamics which, uh, which we give against payment. Last year, for example, we had uh, every year in every um, center, we had a different, a different performance, about 20 and 30 or, or 60 euros. So we brought a very high level artistic procedure for the homeless people. Also volunteer could, also people from outside could uh, could assist this spectacle, could assist this performance uh, for free. We form these, voluntary, these volunteers who want to access the centers, La Casa di Cartone. We explain to them what we're doing, 
and uh, we want to explain to them why we do this artistic work with, work with the people. The three levels of the BEEP are bring art or bring the artist to the public of homeless people, which is a very difficult public because an, art an artist who makes, uh, who gives a performance in a, in a center in Rome, for example, this year, the artist that we're bringing with uh, will participate in San Remo. He will have to reassess his art. He's having. He will have to um, to to face a, a public which is actually depressed, which is hungry, which has no family, which is destitute. So the artist, in reality, has to reassess his own art. The homeless people they don't see this as a situation of game, but they actually make contact with the territory because these people, um, they come from all of Rome and and when these artists come to our centers, then we have a huge request because many people want to come and see these artists for free. We work with this project on three different levels for the homeless people because we want them to reconnect with the territory and also with the, the artist. On the second level, there's the artist who tries to maximize his own art because he brings it to our structures. And the third level is the citizens who follow a performance next, sitting next to a person who is not uh, the usual fan of the artist, but who is a homeless person maybe a person who in this ma moment is very depressed, uh, maybe is even not very clean or is saying bad words. In one year of work, we have seen that these projects have actually brought to a reduction of conflict levels in the centers in which we're holding them. Obviously, this must be periodically. Um, it's going on every month. Uh, we never stop this program, this project. And we work on emotion because we want to activate that emotion that is um, vanishing in homeless people. And this is the most interesting part of our intervention. The emotion that we want to create with BIP must always be followed by a profound reflection. Otherwise, this emotion just flows out and uh, all, what, all that we've created is is, is gone. So we try to keep these people in, uh, we try to keep the homeless people there after the performance so that they can discuss with the artist. Often we have seen that they also criticize the texts of artists, especially also when there is music or poetry. The second project that we are doing is uh, the Night of Homeless People. Every 17th October, and this for the last 12 years, we invite the citizens of Rome to sleep on the streets of Rome and on the, on the squares of Rome. Even this project, it can seem banal because it's just one year, uh, once every year, and we all sleep in the streets and on the squares of Rome to protest, to inform. But it's not really, it's not banal at all because we always try to face to face what people think about homeless people. Every year, on the 17th October, we make one, one month of uh, sensibilization, of information, in which we try to create awareness about homeless people. And we try to pass on the message that it's absurd to call a person homeless or to, to call it with uh, bad words that it not deserves. Homeless, first of all. We define a person with that what he does not possess. I have, for example, I have uh, not finished university, so this would be as if they were calling me the non-university uh, non um, laureate. But I have other qualities. So why should I define a person as stinking, as uh, a, p a person who does not possess anything? 
these persons are visible. Maybe this, maybe what we should actually say, and what we should also say on the 17th of October is, we are all victims. We are the victims of uh, indifference. We don't see, we don't want to see. I think that this already would uh, be something very positive to feed in a political discussion. In Italy, homeless people, we define homeless people as the last category. So how is this possible? We should define them as the first, the people who come first. We have to change the language that we are using. We have to change the concepts that we are using. Because if we continue to call people last of the society, when in reality they should be the first to be addressed, then we will never uh, get on a good, on a good road. It's like with a child, we don't say, you are stupid. We say, you have done something stupid. Because we don't want the child to identify with stupidity. But to those people, we say, you are invisible, you are the last, you are homeless. And these are language problems, linguistic problems, that we should actually address. Because it doesn't help neither them nor, nor us. So our projects, which I've just told you about, because we think that the basic immaterial goods are very important for the homeless people. And we have to involve local administration and citizens in the process, in the, in the help that we give um, homeless people. The homeless people are a urban category because they exist in our metropolitans, in our cities. It's absurd that uh, we have already created this monster in cities, people without houses, houses that are empty. The reflection that we uh, want to pass on in the night for homeless people that we hold on the 17th October, there was only, by the way, there was only once a local politician who slept on the street in all those two, 12 years that we held this night. Many people are private people. But there are also some, but uh, this is the problem because politicians do not see and do not participate. We actually are not providing service. We do not provide food banks. We don't give uh, any clothing, but we try to create awareness. Few words, few ideas. And democracy is created, is made by words. If a people has not, uh, do, does not have words to describe the illness that exists within it, then uh, it cannot help itself. And homeless people do lack words to describe what their problem is. We don't give them words, we don't give them democracy. We use the wrong words. And this is absurd, because in the in the years 1950, there has been a description of the problem. In Tahiti, people made, committed suicide because in the Tahitian culture, there was no word to speak about the really internal, interior weakness and people were so full of this inner um, sufferance, uh, of suffering, they, they couldn't find any way to express it with words, so they committed suicide. And we have the same problem in, uh, in people who are actually committing crimes. Sometimes young people lack the words to describe why they committed crimes. They lack the words to describe why they have done it and why they are um, pushed to do it. And when you talk to homeless people, then you experience the same problem because these people have difficulty to tell you what um, is actually um, making their life worthwhile or what is, making, what is making their life difficult. They don't have the words to express. So we should actually sustain people and support people also when uh, in speaking about what they desire, in speaking what they need. These people need 
to find a place to sleep and need to find food and need to find clothing every single day of their life. But our life, our human life, is not made only out of food and clothing and needing. No, we have desires, we have wishes, because the desire pushes us to go forward. The reflection that we make very often in a polemic way with the local administration because we think that it's necessary that some, someone does it, is uh, quite banal. Roman services, for example. Well, I'm not um, against services. I think services are necessary. But, well, I will just give you this last example. If in these last 30 years, the services did not manage to reduce the number of homeless people, then there's something which does, not, which does not work, which does not turn out right. We need creativity to make things change. I would like to give you a sentence in finishing. I invite you, I call upon you to make a reflection on creativity to find solutions. We are facing the problem with the same thing as in the past and we have not delivered. Einstein also said it's impossible to make, every, to make the same things every day and then expect that things change. We have to take new roads, we have to take new streets, those which are not always used and give them the possibility to become new solutions. We must give the homeless people the opportunity to not be the last, but the first, and to make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much for that um, quite inspiring uh, intervention on raising awareness, challenging opinion, and uh, challenging perspective. And I think in the in the homeless and the destitution uh, work that our organisations in Fianza and your diaconie are doing, innovation <laughs> and creativity is going is key. And we are seeing innovative practices, and, and we hope that we'll be inspired to continue as well. I want to move straight on to our next speaker, Isabella Massafra from Emmaus, Italy. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, together, and I want to be briefly. I am the president of uh, an uh, Emmaus community in Rome. And I'm also the National Secretary of the Emmaus Italy, that is in a movement inside the Emmaus International. And I hope to be a new path, as I uh, was uh, hoping. <laughs> and uh, um, thank you. The Emmaus International Movement is uh, present in 36 countries. This is only to explain that from the beginning, that was uh, almost uh, 70 years uh, Ago, uh, now is increasing the, the um, communities all over the world. Thank you. And what is the Emmaus movement? It is uh, not a religion, a socially responsible, non violent movement, which is independent from any form of power. This is important because for us, because give us the force, the uh, possibility to denounce, to take. Um, a stance and to demand to the politician because that we don't ask for money we are self-sufficient and we we have an aim we have a principle that is to defend the most destitute members of society so we are a community that uh, are in a mix of volunteer and homeless from the beginning, they are homeless, but in, inside the community, we ask them to become uh, the protagonist characters for uh, being solidar, solidar with the others, because there, there is always another. There is always the person who is not inside the community, is not in our family, that is uh, on the street. And they are the characters. Thank you. And uh, the movement is um, a union of differences because uh, from volunteer and homeless, we're coming from different economic position, but we live together in this community 
we are a resi residential community, not only for a short time, 60 days or three months, but for the time that you want. The time that you want to, to make a new path, to, to do something different that you have never been before in your life. That is to be uh, you that uh, have been on the street. You can understand better than the others to help who is not inside a shelter, who is not inside a house, who is not in a, a, a good place to live. And uh, we have, uh, so our principle is the respect of the dignity of human beings, but first of all is solidarity. We repeat to ourselves every day. Go on. And so the communities are very important because we have activities. We don't stay all the day helping, uh, waiting that somebody comes and give us something that we need or, or to how to spend the long day. For an homeless, this is a, a, a new type of life. We say that as everybody wake up at 8 in the morning, so we have to do together, and everybody has to um, a proper activity according to his possibilities, of course, because if somebody is 60 years old and has uh, uh, problems, so we cannot ask to take over an, uh, um, furniture or something else, but it can do something. We rely on donation of furniture and household goods from the public, uh, which are sold in MO's shops. This is uh, another big point, because uh, we are not alone uh, uh, saying to each other, we are a big family, we are good, the other is wrong way. No, we live with the others two times a week. This is the average. The, the shop is open to the public and they are the, the people who is uh, meeting the, the public and uh, uh, offering them the things that are in the, in the shop so they uh, acquire new skills, acquire self-respect because they are, for the first time, for many of them, but they have a new uh, action, new aim, a new uh, path, a new uh, skill, and can support themselves. So nobody help them, but they have an activity and can support the community. So self-sufficiency, that is uh, also uh, a possibility to, to awake people's consciences. It is very important. And we never accept that our survival depends on anything other than our work. And self-sufficiency is also the, the basis for our political action. Because in the community, no, go on, yes community uh, we try to together and so we invited also Nicolò Rinaldi to come to our community and he had a good discussion uh, for an, uh, a night in uh, two hours uh, with our um, people who was as asking him uh, what makes a politician for us and uh, Nicolò Rinaldi explained to us that we are in that case, invisible. We had no vote, we had no uh, chance to be uh, a priority. And what we want to do, we are trying to uh, work uh, in network with other organizations, trade unions, uh, other, and we try to do it uh, worldwide, not only in Italy, not only in France, not only and encouraging political commitment because we think that communication is the first step for becoming a, a, a priority for them. And this is the social charter for the right of housing. We consider ourselves, our community, a medium, uh, long-term um, support. But uh, we tried also to... Um, make uh, something else, something different for people who 
after period in the community wants to stay alone, don't want to stay with other uh, 20, 30 people together, but won't try to, to have an opportunity because they can have also, we hope that many of them can have. Also for family who cannot afford monthly rental. And so we tried, we are um, very, uh, hardly working uh, to uh, providing accommodation to foreign workers. Freedom of movement was uh, is an, an a principle and priority for all the MOS movement, for everybody inside the European Union, but we speak also everywhere. Unconditional shelter is another thing that has, uh, uh, is very important and uh, we had many problems about it because we don't ask uh, paper, documents, uh, passport, uh, or nationality, or we don't ask nothing. We, when they come and stay with us because we have a place for them, we then we, we try to work with them to reconstruction all the, the identity and so see if you need a paper, if you need a, any document, but we don't ask nothing. And uh, this is for all the MOS community in the world. And the solidarity is uh, the key for, for the people that are inside our community. They came because they are in an emergency situation. But uh, with, uh, with us, we try, it's not uh, possible for everybody, but most of them with this new idea to help others, not only themselves, because they know very well the problem. Nobody can uh, speak about it as if uh, not only one night on the street. I think that you have to stay two weeks uh, and can be enough for many of us. They know very well the problem, the situation, the emergencies. And we try with them to arrive to um, a, a new way to live, a new proposal of life, a new stay together, living as poor people, because we don't have uh, building, beautiful buildings, we don't have, we have the, the, the right to help others. And I, I sure that 20 years of my experience that can be a very motivated uh, action. Uh, we spoke, we worked in Italy. This is an uh, Italian uh, um, initiative about the um, the problem that we, we have with the people who are is in the street is uh, the racism, indifference, xenophobia, and together with the 27 organization that was very from right to health, we worked in uh, three years ago to this campaign, national campaign, that was very simple. Not, don't be afraid. Open to the others, open to rights. And it was a very, very, very important experience that was gone on with the others campaign. Also this one is, uh, the treatment of the marginalized groups reflect the way a country will protect human rights in other occasions and treat other groups of people, including its citizens. Because we are suffering also for us, not only for others. This is an, the only number that I had in Italian Amos communities last year was 250 people. And for us it's more than enough to, because there are no other possibilities. But we like to, to give pos experience to others who want to create for us a, a different way of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that very important reminder at the end that the treatment, how we treat the most marginalised in our societies reflects how we think of our citizens generally and our attitude to human rights. And if more member states were perhaps to reflect on that, we wouldn't be sitting here today having this discussion. So thank you very much. I'm going to move straight on again now to Helen Mathy, who is here from Homeless Link in the UK, and to share with us maybe, as Freak already mentioned, some of the phenomenon, particularly in London and elsewhere in England, on the intra-EU migration. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, I've heard of it. I work for Homeless Link. It's a national 
um, organisation just representing England, um, but we have about 530 member organisations who are organisations like day centres, providing accommodation, outreach services, kind of a whole range of organisations working with people who are homeless. So altogether we've kind of got a very strong network. Um, and I guess today I'd kind of give a potted history of the last sort of six, seven years of how our members have kind of responded to the massive kind of change in client growth that they've been seeing from European countries and try and get across some of the challenges, some of the way agencies have responded. So kind of this is very much drawing on the experience of our members. Um, very quickly, our aims as an organisation are to end homelessness in England through changing policy, campaigning and trying to improve services on the ground. So this year we're trying to campaign to ending rough sleeping, a challenge, but we're still uh, got the fight. <laughs> so next. So this is a, a bit of a, a diagram to show. This is figures from London, so just in the capital, of the proportion of rough sleepers since 2005 from the A10 countries. Um, the latest figures had just come through when I left, and this year it's similar, 28% um, from the sort of Central and Eastern European countries. You can see the number has risen and is continuing to rise. Um, the actual numbers of rough sleepers, so this is people living on the streets, basically, um, has actually dropped a little bit, or it's kind of been quite static. But in terms of the proportion from Europe, it's, risen, it's rising quite dramatically. Um, if you've ever, when, sort of 2005, if you've been to London and you might have gone to Victoria Station, there's a, a project just around the corner from Victoria Coach Station. They said 2005, suddenly there were queues all around the block, people arriving from Europe, really not knowing what to expect and very quickly finding themselves that jobs weren't there, it was very expensive and... I think since then it was a bit of a wake-up call to agencies in England to think how do we respond and support people. Thank you. Um, so now, as was said earlier, I don't know if you can see, but the proportion, it's obviously not just the, the clients from Central and Eastern Europe, but other EU countries and other countries, non-UK, so really it's just less than a half of rough sleepers are from the UK. So there's a, been a real change in the demographic and the type of rough sleeper that we're seeing. Um, that figure, 3,975, that was the number of rough sleepers there were in London last year. So the number that have been contacted at least once. On any night, it may be 400. It's debatable, but that's kind of give you a sense of the numbers. Why, why is this happening? Well, this is, may well be similar to the experiences of other countries, but I think these are kind of the, the key issues, very much distilled down. But I think partly it's the people arriving, as I said, and not knowing where to, res where to go for help if they fall out of work or they find difficulty um, kind of getting employment. Um, we did a survey of current rough sleepers from EU countries last year, and this was the figures. So 21% had received any advice around accommodation, only 10% any advice around employment before arriving. Um, so they didn't, they, they admitted they weren't as well prepared as they could have been. However, the issue of employment, lack of secure employment, massive, massive problem. Um, there have been increasing reports of uh, illegal employment trafficking. Um, and a lot of the employment, if they do have it, is cash in hand, illegal, unregistered. So because the way our, our government has set up the welfare benefits, it's very, very difficult, or it has been, um, to access those if you've not had kind of secure and registered employment. Um, the lack of access to accommodation, I'll go on to explain that in a bit more detail, but because, again, of the restrictions the government placed on entitlements to housing benefit, which pays generally for accommodation if you're homeless. It was very, very difficult to access that. Um, and support needs, so people with alcohol, substance, drugs, uh, mental health problems, kind of the big risk factors in terms of uh, ending up rough sleeping. I don't know if this is clear, but I'll, it was just to try and show. Um, if you look on the left, this is 
typically in England, if someone becomes homeless, they can access a hostel so they can get into accommodation and from there they can uh, get health services, they can access drug and alcohol services, support for jobs and hopefully come out the other side and move on. Um, with people from Europe, particularly when the transitional arrangements were in place, um, that was basically that cut off that route. So it was very difficult to access those benefits unless they'd worked for a particular amount of time under the worker registration scheme. So basically that arrow, that meant that a lot of people were ending up rough sleeping. And even though the transitional arrangements have changed now for some clients, there's almost a big backlog of people who fell out of that, had no safety net. So they're kind of really quite entrenched and people living on the streets. Um, in terms of what provision there is in England, I mean, there are services which any client can access, particularly day centres, so basic food, shelter, well, not shelter, day provision, so not for sleeping. Um, and this was a survey of our members last year, and on average, 20% of their clients were from CE backgrounds. Yet, in accommodation, it's tiny proportion, 6%. So that kind of just shows that there are, you know, 28% of people are rough sleeping, the high proportion in day centres, but very few are ending up accessing accommodation. So there's a real difficulty. Why? I think access to accommodation is a real, real challenge. I'll talk a bit more about that. But I think for members as well, it, or our agencies, it was how to respond to a new type of client you know, different support needs, coping with the language skills, staff weren't equipped to deal with it. They admitted, you know, they're not good at working with some, you know, getting over some of those language difficulties. The employment options as well for some of the clients were limited because of their um, knowledge of English, for example. Um, and also for services, there have been a massive cut to funding generally in England over the last year or two because of the economic crisis, I won't go into it. But on average, 22% of funding for homelessness services. So it's all these challenges against quite a difficult uh, context, I guess. Um, so last year, the transitional arrangement ended for A8 clients, so for those from the A8 countries. Um, they note they basically opens now, open up um, access to welfare, so state welfare. However, there is still a requirement to pass what is known as the HRT, the Habitual Residency Test, um, which is very complicated and requires you to look at um, your sort of right to reside and your eligibility. Um, we're finding, you know, in theory, that can provide a better safety net for people, um, but not everybody can pass it because they're not work ready, they're not a worker. Um, it also can take very long for the process. So... It's possibly one option and one opportunity, but yeah, there are still other issues that are not going to go away. Um, and obviously, people from Romania and Bulgaria are still subject to the transitional arrangements. So what do we do? What have we been doing? Um, I guess there've, there's been a real push, certainly from, from our point of view, to inform agencies more about the entitlements. And my colleague's just been doing these trying to clarify HRT and the benefits is very, very complicated, particularly for a client if you've got very poor English as well as for staff. So partly it's about knowing your rights, knowing which services you can access, where to go for support. Um, a lot of agencies have very sort of targeted or specialist services to help people, migrants with employment, with advice. Uh, there's a project, I've put a couple of projects on the end of the slides where they have, you know, specialist workers, know how to, you know, which agencies are credible and provide safe work. Um, also working with Job Centre Plus, which is our kind of uh, government uh, job advice service and agency. Um, and increasingly, agencies are working more with native speakers and volunteers so that the service can be better for these clients. Um, also looking at preventative work, so how we can help people prepare better um, before they arrive so that when they arrive they've got a better chance of finding a job, knowing where to go if the moment they face difficulty so they don't end up rough sleeping. And we're exploring some options with 
the embassies at the moment and we've been doing quite a lot of work over the last couple of years. The other, the other big thing is reconnection and it's, it's kind of been referred to earlier and it is a, a difficult subject, I think, um, but in England anyway, there was a pilot sort of two years ago when we first looked at what, how reconnection could work. Um, I guess there's two, yeah, it can work, it can be an option for people who are destitute and there is very little other opportunity or access to uh, benefits but I would really stress the point that was made earlier that it has to be voluntary and it has to be supported it's not it cannot be just a ticket home and there have been you know it's been a quite a tricky issue in the UK a lot of press have been uh, well it's very controversial I think but there have been some really effective examples of where reconnection has worked um, there's some kind of web ad web uh, please. <laughs> uh, websites advice for agencies so that they can do it safely and link in with services in home countries uh, yeah. um, I was just going to mention a pilot that has been done in London which I think is an interesting model of how reconnection can work um, it's called the no second night out pilot it's this kind of new policy agenda really that I guess it's acknowledging that people will always at risk of rough sleeping, but no one should ever have to spend more than one night out on the street. So it's this kind of new, I guess it's re looked at the concept of rough sleeping, what prevention can be done. Um, so there was a pilot in London paid for by uh, the government, local government, um, and it set up a hub which basically any new rough sleeper could be referred to, and within 72 hours they would be helped into accommodation or into off the streets and part of that did involve reconnection so it looked at how reconnection could work and in the sort of six months that it was set up 31 percent of those reconnections were outside the uk most back to europe um, and yeah actually 69 percent from of rough sleepers from european countries were reconnected back to their home country it, i guess i would say it was always we didn't run the pilot we've just been kind of watching with interest but um, I guess the learning was linking people back into services. Obviously, it had to be voluntary, but there was quite a strong message that for some people, if they stay in England, they will die on the streets because, rightly or wrongly, the system has set, makes it very difficult to access accommodation. Um, and there have been you know, a lot of deaths on the streets, and I think this is kind of a recognition that actually maybe sometimes, if there isn't a service that can help them back home, is that an option? So... There are some examples um, up there. I think particularly it works, they found it works with people who were quite new to the streets, so newly arrived um, and kind of can be reconnected if it's the right option. But again, I would stress it's a voluntary, <laughs> a voluntary scheme. Um, but yeah, it's been quite interesting. Um, these are some of the things our members kind of have fed back about what can be done to improve things further, I guess. Um, going back I, to the issue of better prevention and how we can get those messages and support and advice to individuals before they arrive and once they arrive. Um, we want to do more around illegal employment and trafficking. There's been a real kind of uh, sharp increase in reports over the last six months in particular of people being promised work, arriving, and then nothing materialising um, and also yeah how we can get that kind of coordinated response um, to prevent destitution if it happens um, in the UK again we want to look at what we can do around the illegal work but also really keep the pressure on our government agenda um, we've been kind of shouting about this for years and you know it is on the agenda but it's very difficult it's an issue that is not popular <laughs> Homelessness isn't popular and migrant homelessness is even less popular. So I guess that that's what we need to do. Um, that reconnection, if it does grow, that it's done properly and it's done safely um, and people are supported properly when they get back home. Um, and looking at employment, a lot of people are kind of can work, but with employment as it is, it's very difficult. So looking at what other targeted support we can give to people um, 
particularly working with our Job Centre Plus network. Um, that's some just some examples of some services around the reconnection and the no second night out. Um, and I would, if you're interested, I would recommend the report because it also looks at the, the longer term sustainability of reconnection. It was only a three month follow up, but I think one of the criticisms is what happens when people go back and is it, you know, to somewhere that can be sustained. So it's quite interesting. Um, so I will leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's always useful to have these very concrete statistics. And I think what we see from, from your presentation is this is not something that's decreasing. It's something that's increasing and has been increasing now for five or six years. And we know from our members that this is not just in London. It's not just in England. Yeah. This is across, across Europe. Um, and I think the, the second point that's quite useful for us to think about is the question of prevention. Mm. We talk a lot about providing emergency services, but there's also work to be done to equip people for that move in the first place. So, so that's something for us to consider as well. We're going to move a little bit further north now uh, to Denmark and hear from Ola Meldgaard from Kofod School in, in Denmark. Thank you, Ola. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, um, Kofod School in Copenhagen is a huge social institution working with many different activities and uh, to, uh, towards uh, people who are uh, socially excluded, and the school has just finished a two-year project reaching out towards homeless from Eastern European countries in Copenhagen. And the lesson from this project is that the homeless from Eastern Europe uh, are in a dire situation and that there seems to be no easy solution in the present situation. During the project, <coughs> uh, uh, the project period, we were in contact with 187 people from 19 countries. Most of the homeless, they came from Poland, from Romania, from Bulgaria, and from the Baltic states, but also from Serbia, Albania, Belarus, Ukraine, and Russia. 90% uh, of those uh, contacted were men, about 50% were under 35 years old, and almost 75% were under 50 years. Some of them had been homeless in Denmark for several years, or they had stayed in other countries before coming to Denmark. At least one out of six, but probably more, uh, came not directly from their home country, but from another European country. Several had been in Germany, UK, and Sweden before coming to Denmark. When we asked them why they came to Denmark, they almost all said that they came to work and to earn money. They had heard about jobs in Denmark and they were well paid these jobs and that they could earn much more money in Denmark than in their own country. However, they didn't know much about the labor market situation in Denmark or about employment. And it seems that they were driven by some imagination of life and work in Denmark rather than knowledge. They realized that it might be difficult to find work for the minimum salary on the Danish labor market, but even for a lower salary, they might earn more than at home. And they described the job situation in their home countries as impossible for them, and they could not get a job or own it to a very low salary. In the project, we estimated the employability of the group and found that about one third might be able to find a job and earn money. They had the necessary resources for a job and they had the language skills in English and maybe Danish. And they had some work experiences already, but because of the recession and growing unemployment, it was also difficult for this group to find a job. <clears throat> Altogether, 40 of those we met told that they had worked in Denmark. And this includes also jobs on the black labor market and very short-term jobs for a few days or a few weeks. Some of the employers took advantage of them and didn't pay them the salary. And some of them didn't get a contract. And some worked under very dismal conditions. In cases where the job was not legal, they of course didn't get a registration with the Danish authorities and they could afterwards not prove that they had worked and earned rights in Denmark. But they felt they needed the money and took the job, 
when the project finished, six had a legal job. It was part of the project to help the homeless people from Eastern Europe uh, to find a job. Our staff members helped them to translate CV into Danish, to read job advertisements in newspapers and job databases, and to contact employers and write applications, often with poor results. In many cases, they were disqualified from the beginning because they spoke only their native languages. And if they found a legal job and had to register with the authorities, it is quite demanding to fill in all uh, these necessary papers. And if you don't speak the language and you live in the streets, it is almost impossible. When they found a job, it could be in a hotel, in cleaning, as sandwich men in the streets, or they delivered newspapers. We also provided courses in Danish and English languages, and we informed them about the Danish labor market systems and rules and norms in Denmark in general. Most of them had no knowledge of the Danish society, and it was difficult for them to get information about work, housing, support and support in cases of sickness. They didn't understand what they were told in job centers, if not assisted by one of the staff members in the project. She, because she was a woman, she also assisted them to hospitals and were called from hospitals in some cases when they had a patient they could not speak to. Most of the homeless were not employable because of several reasons. But in general, they often had problems with alcohol and or mental problems and lack of language skills. 80% did not speak Danish to, to any level and 53% uh, didn't speak any English. Because they had no money uh, for housing, they often slept in the streets, in train stations, in tents, empty buildings, in subways, or in night shelters, or in churches, or at friends in some cases. As Freak uh, told, um, in Denmark, uh, the homeless institutions that are financed by money from the state are not allowed to accept uh, homeless from Eastern European countries that cannot support themselves. At least they run the risk of having their um, support reduced. And this, has not, this policy has not changed uh, after the new government yet. To find a place to live was almost uh, impossible because of the prices on rented rooms, not to speak uh, of apartments. Some rented a room together and shared the cost. But they ran out of money and lost the room again. At the end of the project, only two had a room on a permanent basis. Some came to Denmark with money for a few weeks. They started to live in a room, but, because, uh, but became homeless when the money was spent. Some experienced homelessness for the first time in Denmark. In most cases, they survived collecting bottles in the streets and selling the bottles for the deposit in shops, and they had free meals in charity uh, institutions. In several cases, it was difficult, difficult to get informa information um, on how many years they have stayed in Denmark, but at least one fourth had stayed several years in Denmark. Others were only passing by. If they didn't find a job, they left for another country. Some uh, had also been in and out of Denmark several times. A few were a kind of season workers here and there. Most of them lived uh, in Denmark without any contact to public authorities, job centers, tax authorities, embassies, or police. One third had or had had such a contact. Often it was quite difficult to get them to tell about themselves. They were often closed and not informative about their past in their home countries. Some had regular mental diseases and delusions one told, whispering that to the staff member, that three ships were coming to Copenhagen, and when these ships arrived, it would be the end of the world. 
Some were very closed in themselves, or they only and or they spoke to themselves. Some had obviously left their home country after bad and painful experiences in the family or with friends or authorities. 46% told that they did not want to go home at all. For the Poles, the figure was 61%, although it was difficult for them to find a job. They disliked to speak about their past and their home country. Some said that they didn't feel they had a home country or their home was where they stayed. It was part of the, pro of the project to help the Poles to return to Poland in a decent way and to connect to social institutions in Poland. And we offered to drive them to Poland, but it was very difficult to motivate them to go home. Some of them we helped to return came back again to Denmark after a period. An older man who had a son who wanted to help his father but he refused to be a burden for the son, and this old homeless said that he wanted to live and he wanted to die in Denmark. Uh, and some told that they had lost all contact to their home country, and uh, they asked, what am I going to do there? Uh, if, and if they were expelled from Denmark, they would return again, they said. Uh, those who wanted to go home, they wanted it because of illness that could not be treated in Denmark, not because they could see a better future back home. The homeless from Eastern Europe were interested to get to know about the Danish labor market, the housing market, and in general learn more about the Danish society. They needed help to CV translation of job advertisements, contact to employers, about salaries, tax, civil registration, and filling in these forms. And almost 50% of the people we met, uh, they received such, such assistance, and there was quite a good demand for such help. The objective of the project was to take the homeless off the streets and help them to go home or to find a job and a place to live in Denmark. These aims were difficult to fulfill. Instead, we found that we should support them in Denmark and as unemployed and homeless, also a kind of harm reduction. In our place, they could get a shower, clean clothes, coffee and tea, but also information about the Danish society and about the Danish labor market. We also offer them some consultations about addiction from a Polish, uh, a Polish uh, psychologist, and we help them with antibus and also some dental service. We had also a legal service and consultation from a street lawyer, and as I said, classes in Danish and English. So often we help them in emergency situation, and we invited them to participate in holidays for instance, Christmas Eve at Kufu School. Um, so, the, the, the project turned out that most of the time we helped them in their situation in Copenhagen, trying to reduce their difficulties. For some of the homeless, their situation worsened as time passed and they didn't find a job and started to earn money. They started to drink, or their drinking became worse. They were often aware of this themselves, but they felt that it was shameful that they could not support themselves and that they could not realize their dream. Some had pretended to friends and families at home that they did very well in Copenhagen, and they had not told them that they were homeless. Some said, that they would not return until they had money in their pockets and they would not return as homeless or failures. We asked the homeless what they thought was the key to improving their situation in Denmark. And they all pointed to a job. And this focus on a job was very strong. A job was the key that could break the vicious circle and bring them out of homelessness and drinking and living in the streets and bad thoughts. 
unemployment on the other side resulted in homelessness, in addiction and reduced motivation to seek jobs. And they fell caught in a vicious circle and obviously they needed some services to improve their opportunities to find a job. With some services we might be able to help some of the homeless to break the circle and help them uh, get going in a more positive way. However, the present strategy allows only for expulsion. I doubt this will ever be a solution to the problem. The homeless will return and they will continue to be homeless and unemployed and addicted and they will have mental problems. I think it is time to recognize this phenomenon as an EU issue that has to find a solution on the EU level. It is a result of free movement within EU. And the, uh, the solution must be on an EU sol solution involving the Commission and the Member States. As long as each nation state is left to handle this situation, I fear not much will happen for the homeless Eastern European. National homeless are covered by national laws, but transnational homeless are not covered. And the result is a transnational underclass. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ola, for that uh, very clear call for the European Union to take on this problem. And, and indeed, you're right, there is the creation of a transnational underclass as a result of what's supposedly the, the flagship policy and creation of the European Union. We move on to our last speaker from practice, that's from Stockholm uh, City Mission, Stadtmission, and that's Artu Moksen. Thank you. Prosecutor citizen addresses the needs of foreign EU citizens and third country nationals with permanent resistance permits from another EU country that live in poverty, homelessness, and unemployment in Stockholm. Uh, this is a project that will also run an advice and support centre in Stockholm from the 1st of the March until the 28th of the February next year. And this um, centre is the crossroads, and I am the manager of the, uh, this unit. Crossroads will also uh, create networks, coordinate resources, and build public opinion while working for the inclusion of the EU citizens. It is run by the Stockholm City Mission, Salvation Army, uh, the City of Stockholm, and the Public Employment Agency of Sweden. And the project is financed through the European Social Fund. And Crossroads, the center, pair of old shoes. These shoes were photographed the 1st of March uh, last year. The background. Why Crossroads? Due to an increase in number of EU immigrants in Stockholm. Um, this number of migrants has been growing a lot since 2009. Our target group does not have access to the social welfare system. Uh, for example, they are not entitled to, to get into the night shelters. Uh, because of the lack of the correct information about Swedish society among the group, uh, they believe they have kind of a fantasy built of Sweden that there is a job for almost everyone and easy to get a job, which is not true. And the social services are not a justice to our target group's needs, if there were any. Target group, group for any EU citizens and non-European citizens that have a permanent residence permit in another EU country. Uh, these third nation, country nationals are usually been working in uh, countries like Spain, Italy and France in that order, and they come from the African and South American continents. Our goal is to counteract act, act social exclusion and poverty among the target group. 
in every way. And what do we offer? We offer individual action plans, various causes, Swedish civic information, which is very important, and of course, food, warmth, and rest. And this is the personal from five different countries. Five EU advisors and one unit manager. Uh, all the EU advisors have um, different kind of areas of responsibilities. We work with labor market and employers networking that has become a very important um, area of, of responsibility because almost everyone comes to Stockholm to, to seek work. If you ask them why do you come, I come here because I want work, I want money, I want to leave. Culture and repatriation. Culture is a, a minor area right now and repatriation is a minor area as well because Nobody wants to come home. Nobody wants to get home. They want to stay. Volunteers and participants, coordination, uh, Stats Mission, City Mission has a lot of volunteers. Healthcare is not a big area because uh, most of the um, participants are very healthy. There are maybe five, ten men who have been uh, ill since the start. Gender equality is also, something we do, cost development and coordination uh, is important. <coughs> Communication, website administration, statistics and documentation are of course important because this is a project. And we in the personal, we speak 11 languages, Arabic, Armenian, English, Finnish, French, Litauanian, Polish, Romanian, Romanian, Russian and Spanish. Fluently. And uh, with the voluntary, I think we speak about 30 or 40 languages, which is unique. Individual council in action plan meeting, this is one of them. Katarzyna from Poland is, is doing one of, of those. Uh, then we have individual psychotherapy sessions, uh, juridical support, informational meetings for the newcomers and for the employers who want to um, hire somebody or give work to somebody, they can come to a center and this kind of speed dating. Uh, all these activities are in participants' language and this is unique and I, we believe this is needed as well. And translation of documents, CVs, certificates, everything can be translated. Uh, this is our home page. As you can see the languages, you see the names of the country and the flag, flags. Activities, courses, we have foreign languages, English and Swedish. We have four Swedish courses in a week and this is of course popular when you uh, come from another country. You have to learn the language and they know this and they, they take a part of the Swedish courses. Computer using is very popular. Uh, we have a small internet cafe, uh, but 2025 computers as well, which is very uh, popular because it's the only way to have contact with uh, families in home countries. Uh, this is by using Twitter and, um, for example, Facebook. Job searching is important. Cooking course for young bachelors, <laughs> because most of the participants are uh, young men. Uh, discussion groups, discussion group for women. Uh, we started with uh, Roma women, but nowadays it is uh, almost every woman wants to be in this group. And discussion group led by the psychologist. And then the basic needs and services. The uh, center is open from 8 to 4 o'clock and these basic needs and services you can get between 8 o'clock and 12 o'clock. Uh, medical assistant, there's a doctor and a nurse coming to the center once a week. Uh, pedicure, hairdressing, two meals a day for free, possibility to laundry and shower and rest. Uh, why I always say the laundry and showers and hairdressing is that when you ask them what is important for you, uh, when you look, are looking for a work, so most of the um, participants say that you can be hungry and you can be tired, but no, nobody can see it. But if you uh, 
smell badly, you wear dirty clothes, your hair is not cut, you won't get that job. So this is important. Our volunteers, over 160 volunteers, I think the um, exact number is uh, 164. Interpreters, translators, teachers, lawyers, psychologists, chiropractists, hairdressers and cooks as well. Our participants. So far, participants from 87 countries. And I think you can see the countries, Romania, Poland, Morocco, Spain, Algeria, Nigeria, Tunisia, Ghana, Colombia, Colombia. It's almost the entire world. Uh, some of them say, say that this is not an EU project, this is a worldwide project um, already. So all the world is here. Third country nationals and EU citizens, March to November. Uh, about 55 EU citizens and third country nationals, 45 persons. And from March to May, these were our first months. You can see that the European citizens were 60 persons and third country nationals only 40. Uh, so this group is growing all the time. Some days they can be about 70 persons of the all participants in one day, about 100, 120 participants. So this is a uh, very important information for Europe. A June to August, this is the summer, uh, 50, 50. And September to November, 55 to 45. And in January, February, it's 50, 50 again. The gender, 93% are men and seven uh, women. Uh, Actually, only uh, women we have are the Roma women uh, because they are um, migrating in families. And the maturity age is uh, between 21 and 20, uh, 45 years. And this means that 75 persons of the participants are between 21 and 46 years. Education. The majority are educated within a trade. Uh, as you can see, the 70 persons has a vocational education. Primary school, high school, 15 persons, and university education, 15 persons. This university education groups, uh, we didn't have it in the beginning. It's a group that has been growing during the months. And the professions, the top, uh, uh, top Three professions are builders, carpenters, and mechanics, mechanics, but there are about 26, 27 different professions. Our experience, what could work better? Participants' ex expectations. Um, when they come to the center, they expect that we have work them to give, and when they, we say no, you have to go to a public employment agency. So they get sad. Cooperation with some embassies was not the best in the beginning. Uh, it is not for the moment either, but it, it's still better. And cooperation with some authority could be better as well. What works best is, of course, civic information, information, correct information about Swedish society, labor market, housing, everything. Action plans, counseling, individual contacts are popular. All the courses are popular, especially Swedish and English. The great importance of language and cultural knowledge, volunteer, co-workers and personnel. Uh, feedback uh, from the participants. According to our polls, survives and verbal contacts. The participants' experience are jobs and housing expectations high, civic information in their own language, uh, personal contacts with personnel and volunteer co-workers. As you can see, they think about the same way we do. And the next steps is documentation, information distribution, which we are doing all, all the time. And uh, during the spring, networking with Scandinavia and Europe. And then uh, the project and material will be analyzed in September, October. 
uh, uh, this year the fall, and then we'll we'll do the last finishing, and then we should have the method and concept completed in December or January uh, this year, and then January next year, and then uh, right now, so the project will be shut down the last of February. So there is not so much time left. There are three important things to remember. The first is to find out, to search out how many of these homeless persons are. Nobody knows it exactly. It's, it's, it's impossible to do it. You can count it if you, if you want to, at least a little bit. Second is uh, who has the responsibility of these persons. The window is called, especially in Scandinavia, in Stockholm. It is it's very cold. It's not fun to sleep under a bridge. It is uh, dangerous. And third is to get to society. Society is, you could say, prepared for even more people. They will come. That's what we believe. Thank you. And you are welcome to visit us in Stockholm. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, uh, Arto. And uh, now, before to, to go to move to the next session, I uh, wonder if anybody wants to put some questions to any of the speakers who have taken the floor so far. We can have a short question session. Have to leave. Now I have to take the questions. <laughs> Please. My name is Nina Hu. I come from Copenhagen, where I work with uh, homeless people and also uh, homeless EU uh, citizens. I'd just like to give you one piece of information that I hope also will form your, your view on homeless people. We have a project where we have been meeting around 140, from 140 to 150 homeless EU citizens. And I w wanted to tell you that none of those people have asked for social help. They come and ask for jobs. Nobody wants to be a burden. Thank you. Yeah, that's very relevant. Yeah, sorry. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, Sophie Lenay from the regional representation here in Brussels for the West Midlands region. Um, a very quick question um, um, to a few, the, the future speaker from DG Employment um, and also reflecting on what the um, um, speakers have here said today. Uh, the criminalisation of homelessness in Hungary is a very, very serious concern and I would like to know whether uh, the Commission is, in, is actually able to do anything about this situation because at the moment it's only reiterated that it's going to look into judges, the independence of the, uh, the National Bank and I can't remember what the third one was but um, it, is, it is a really shocking uh, development and one that uh, may have uh, um, a ripple effect across the EU. Um, the second point is the, the the precarious nature of funding to finance what we've just um, seen in uh, in Stockholm. This is obviously an ESF, I think, understood uh, finance project of, of just under two years. Uh, it's incredible the work that's been going on, but it's also quite uh, worrying that these projects can uh, start and finish within a, within a whisker of a time. And, and uh, that sort of precarious nature of funding just is, is just, is just uh, incredibly difficult to sustain uh, interest in political interest in the problem. And just a very quick third point, if I may. Um, we're running a Daphne project. Uh, Daphne is the EU programme to com combat violence, and it's a project called Women Rough Sleepers. Um, there's, I've left uh, leaflets out on the table for anybody interested. Uh, it's a project that's looking at female rough sleeping um, across the EU, and we have um, partners from Hungary uh, who are really struggling uh, to, be, to continue being involved in our project. So um, if you want more information, you can come up to me afterwards. Thank you very much. So, any other questions? Nothing? If you want, please. Eh, oui, Luigi Leonori, eh, SMES, Santé Mentale, Exclusion Sociale. Moi, je voudrais eh, souligner exactement ce que disait Nina eh, par rapport au travail. Sans maison, sans travail, c'est une double souffrance mentale pour ces personnes. Right. 
I think that we need to reinvent how work is organized because uh, if uh, we draft all the forms, all the necessary forms, I think that these people will remain out of job anyway. And, and jobs, finding a job for this, these people is uh, a true necessity. We have to reinvent how jobs are conceived. It's not about competition, competitiveness. It's about reinventing what we mean with a job. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, since we, we are running uh, in shortage of time, and uh, if I well take, there was just the one genuine question to Mr. Sasso, who is supposed to speak uh, afterwards. So maybe you can include the answer to these questions in, in your address. So we move to the next session, but before to move to the next session, I know that Cecilia uh, uh, don't have much time, so uh, if you most welcome Cecilia that uh, she, she hosted this, uh, this event today to, to, to take the floor now. Thank you. I might be able to come back, but I will have to leave the session and then hopefully come back for the very last minutes. But I, 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 I wanted to, to take the opportunity to address the problem with what's going on in, in, in Europe and specifically in certain member states. I think this might be the right time to do it before we go into the second part of, of this seminar. Um, First of all, we must all remember that Europe used to be a continent of departure. And people are migrants from, we can read about this in every culture throughout. If you would like to, we could go to the Old Testament of the Bible and see that whenever people's situation have been threatened, they fled to seek a better future elsewhere. And this is also, I'm from a country where some, not even 100 years ago, 25% of the population in Sweden at this time left to seek a better future in the United States. And this raises to all of us the overall question, are we to build a fortress Europe or are we to maintain a society, a continent where people in a free way and in a legal way can, can, can come here? So this is one of the questions that I really would, would all of us to, to reflect upon. Um, and the other thing I was thinking of when listening to you is that mobility, which is one of the core pillars of the European Union, has a dark backside. The other side of the coin is that it, it, it could be a poverty trap, and it is a poverty trap, and leads to destitution of as many as maybe four million homeless persons in Europe today, approximately four, four million persons. And this is a very severe, it's, it's just simply undignified. And it is not, in my view, worthy the European Union in the 21st century to have this kind of situation where we don't even know the figures, the facts and figures. So one call from today, I think, to give the Commission again a recommendation to monitor and map this increasing problem. We need to see clarification also of the legislation on, on the free movement. We need to see what it actually means. It is time for Europe, I think, to start addressing this issue from a different angle hand in hand with the financial crisis and as a consequence of the financial crisis is this increasing problem of, of um, uh, destitution of human beings in Europe today. I came back from Athens yesterday and what, what we see there is a horrifying example. First of all, third country migrants, asylum seekers that whose asylum application has not even been looked at for years, in some cases. And the other part, thousands of, of Athenians, of, of Greek citizens, that some months ago used to have a decent job and salary. They walked their kids to school. They came back. They, they cooked in the afternoon. And they put the kids to sleep. Today, they are 
totally impoverished. They don't have anything and cannot have a decent life anymore. And, and I'm very worried about the situation in Europe when it comes to human dignity. This is something that we need, need to address. And finally, the situation in Hungary. Well, there is a cold wind blowing in Europe. And we, we, it's, I'm not only talking about the temperature now, even though it's uh, unbelievably cold everywhere. Uh, the cold wind that blows in Europe is blowing freezing cold in Hungary these days, where a law has been approved to fine and imprison homeless persons sleeping in the streets. And it's not only in Hungary. It seems to be the trend in many places to criminalize homelessness. It's deeply cynical that, that human beings in Hungary have been outlawed since December 1st. After a first warning, homeless persons will be fined 445 euros or imprisoned. And I wonder, and that's why I had to leave the room to speak to the Hungarian television about this, why have the Hungarian authorities decided to criminalize homeless persons? Do they really believe that this is a correct and efficient way to fight homelessness? I mean, with a fine of 445 euros, nobody would be homeless. They could pay a rent somewhere for this amount of money. And this is something that we need to address. It's undignified, extremely undignified manner. And I think that we should, at this moment, reflect on what Desmond Tutu once said. He said, yesterday is history, and tomorrow is to all of us a mystery. But today is a present and a time to take action. And if we have this in mind, maybe the outcome from this seminar could be somehow at least a proper address and a, um, a demand to the Commission to at least monitor and map the problem and put this issue on top of the agenda. And I'm very, very upset about this, maybe because it reminds me of what I did in my professional life for many, many years when I worked as a prison priest, when I, I met people basically on the street and they were not in this kind of numbers in those days. But now this is an, an increasing number and an increasing situation where, where, where people of, or countries of Europe actually is acting in a way where, where, where we, not, we don't treat human beings as human beings anymore. So somebody I met in Athens said that in this country they treat human beings worse than animals. And to me this is Shilling, it's horrifying to listen to this kind of statement. So, what do we do? We move on to the next session, and I hope that I will be able to join you for that. I will go in and out probably, but, but I just felt that I wanted to share with you my thoughts as for now. And um, common standards, finally. Yeah, this is maybe the, the most important thing I was thinking about that if we had some kind of common standards, qualifications, or I don't know how we should define it, but common standards in, in the EU 27 member states, that would reduce or even elimin eliminate or the, the social tourism that certain member states are talking about, or the pull factor that some other cynical member states intend to speak about, the pull factor. Well, I don't see Sweden or Denmark as such attractive countries, actually. Very different climate, extremely different language, extremely bad social habits, bad even food manners, by the way. Uh, so, so this is not a paradise, and we need to get into our minds that we are not any paradises in Europe anywhere. So the pull factor, we should eradicate this kind of, of language when we are talking about desperate and, and the desperation in the situation. We should address it properly by putting common standards in Europe where the, the European Union member states in the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for... for um,
perhaps putting the passion and the, the humanity into this debate once again as well as, as we did earlier on. I think we, 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 we see consistently that if we continue to look at homelessness and destitution as a criminal act, it only further exacerbates the problem and marginalises people even further. We have to get out of this, this discourse completely. One small comment, and I think uh, uh, Ms Delhi wishes to... Can I just say something more? I will turn 47 on October 17th, which means that I would appreciate an invitation to Rome. So it's a birthday party on the streets of Rome with a difference, I think we're looking to. Perhaps that's something we like can encourage. Like the Doris, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, something like, uh, I think all politicians, I think from, from our friend from Rome earlier on, said that only one uh, politician had actually participated in the action in, in Rome. Perhaps we can encourage all people in leadership and who have political influence to actually spend time with people who are affected by this phenomenon and hear from them as well. And, and we will only Im Im learn to improve the situation that we already have. Uh, I know there are some people who want to ask questions, but out of respect to the speakers that we, we have still to speak, I think it's important we take them and then we have time at the end, we can take some additional questions. So um, I'm delighted that Karim Adeli has been able to be with us this afternoon and uh, look forward to, to your intervention and your perspective. Thank you. That's the one. Merci de, de m'avoir invité. Je remercie euh, Monsieur Rinaldi. Je remercie encore une fois la fête. Thank you, Mr. Rinaldi. Thank you for organizing this uh, conference and uh, thank you, uh, Diac Diaconia. The issue of uh, homelessness is something which is very uh, dear to me, something that I've been working on since the beginning of my mandate, I wrote a statement back in December 2010, and we are in 2012, and I wrote the resolution of the European Parliament in uh, September, last September. One speaks a lot about uh, homelessness, about, but we speak about homeless people when they die, when they suffer hunger. There are today 400, 400 people who died in the past uh, few days and we are undergoing this uh, very uh, deep cold winter and I'm very hungry and angry. Ça fait deux ans on attend les drames. Ça fait deux ans que nous demandons une stratégie européenne des sans-abri. Donc j'ai fait lancer un appel notamment à Monsieur Barroso et à Monsieur Van Rompuy pour qu'ils se réveillent. Together with some others of my colleagues from the European Parliament, it's time to urgently take measures because we need to make to we need that all European member states do everything they can to guarantee access and to guarantee the minimum needs for all people in Europe. We need it urgently. Homeless people cannot wait. We ask very clearly that uh, people take their courage and accept a resolution, the strategy of the European Union for homeless people now, they must adopt it now with all their willingness. The situation, as we have seen from different presentations today, clearly shows that all the associations are innovating. You all work with innovation, you all are innovative. But the situation is really, really horrible and really bad. For the past two years, or the the conference, the consensus conference under the Belgian presidency has been held two years ago. And ever since, the situation has just gotten worse. We spoke about Greece. Within two years, home, the number of homeless people has risen by 25%. This is due to the economic crisis, to the austerity measures. 
now these homeless people are threatened by the police, they are threatened um, by law. But even in France, you can see you can see that there are now laws appearing, laws appearing that threaten the homeless people because it is now forbidden to um, to look for food in waste paper baskets, for example. The crisis and the austerity measures that have been taken by the governments have only worsened a situation which had already been unacceptable before. As to free circulation, free movement, France, what did France do? Finally, they stigmatized the Roma, they expulsed the Roma, they sent them back to Romania and Bulgaria, and they did not grant them the least of human rights that they had the right to. We speak of Iraq, Afghanistan, Tunisia, but if you go to the north of France, it's even, you can see the same situation of destitution, you find the same horrible situations. These are people who live in slum-like conditions and they just wish they can go to, to England or to Paris one day. They have no possibility whatsoever to return to their origin, to their home countries. So when we speak of free movement, in the treaties of the European Union, Many rights have been enshrined, but also in the other texts of the European Union, the right to a minimum standard housing, the right to basic needs. All this is enshrined in our treaties. Article 36 states that there is that there is a right to have uh, one's basic needs covered. And uh, we have asked the European Commission in Britain if she thinks that the homeless people in countries like Hungary or also in countries like France, if they are treated in a way that is conform with our legislation. Donc, uh, the service of the Commissioner Laszlo Andor has answered that these countries that these countries have the right to take measures to bring these people back to their countries and these member countries have to respect the Charter of Fundamental Rights and the provisions of the European Union when they are doing so. I would just like to finish by saying something about this, something recommend, some recommendations that we can formulate um, following the discussion that we had and following all the work that, had, that has already been done in the consensus conference. The first proposition, the first suggestion is whoever the people are that live on the European territory, they are human, they are human beings. We must not forget that. Europe must rebuild itself and it must be a solid uh, Europe of solidarity. Solidarity, whatever the juridical, the legal status of the persons, they are all the same as regards the fundamental rights the right to food, the right to health. I would even go further and say that these are fundamental rights for every human being, whatever its nationality. Every person who lives in poverty has right, has right to these, to these um, essential needs and services. 
So we have to find a sustainable sol solution to this situation. Secondly, I would state, like to state that the people who are in temporary or emergency housing solutions are often also very often have uh, a difficulty in finding a, a sustainable and a long-term housing possibility. Thirdly, we have to give a particular attention to women who are migrating, especially women who are victims of prostitution or forced work, forced labor. Who, have, uh, who are undocumented, who do not have any identity documentation. And asylum seekers have the right to housing while their procedures are ongoing. So member states are obliged to help asylum seekers in this time. And the European Union must do something, must act when member states do not respect their obligations in this sense. Finally, we have also observed another, another horrible situation in these past years, a criminalization of the solidarity uh, that people bring towards, towards homeless people and needing people. If you know the film Welcome, this is an illustration and a, a a perfect example of what is happening. If you, if you help someone, if you are, if you show solidarity with someone, this can never be an act of an act that can be criminalized. But this is an act that should be fostered and supported. The strategy of the European Union for homeless people must be an integrated strategy. It must take into account the migration and the multiple facets and of migration and of homeless people. It must also take into account the, differ the different social protection systems of European Union member states. It must also take into account um, options such as uh, seasonary work. Now the ball is into, in the Commission's field, so the Commission must act. I will continue to be angry and I will continue to go on, fall on your nerves until the Commission acts. I was so angry that I even wanted to go on hunger strike, but my collaborators, my colleagues told me not to do so. I'm angry because we do have the capacity to renew, to renew the connection between citizens and Europe by saying that, the Europe, that Europe is capable in protecting the weakest amongst us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, just one comment I'd like to add. You talked about the capacity to renew the relationship between Europe and citizens. We also have the capacity to end homelessness in Europe, or at least to drastically reduce it. And it's for that reason, I think, uh, that Fianza and ourselves, are, are, as your Dai are quite united in calling for an EU strategy. But we wait still both for the European Commission and for member states to actually take action to do so. And it's perhaps with some trepidation I turn now to the Commission <laughs> and to, to Jonut uh, Sassou, who uh, I think we cannot expect him to have all the answers to everything this afternoon, but certainly to give some reflection on this issue of um, homelessness and EU free movement, and perhaps some, some pointers of where further work could be done between the European Parliament and the European Commission, and importantly, member states as well. And we, we mustn't forget that we also need member states to be willing to take action because that's where a lot of the, the problems can arise. So um
as well as to the, uh, the members of uh, FANS and of Euro um, Diakonia. I have been um, listening carefully to the um, uh, contributions and reports from, from the practitioners from uh, Italy, UK, uh, Denmark and Sweden as well as to the call uh, for actions from the institutional actors uh, from the European Parliament and from the um, civil society networks. Um, and um, I have to say that these um, calls have been very useful in bringing up the message that um, homelessness in general and um, the um, situation of, uh, of migrants, third country nationals and uh, EU mobile citizens is, um, is a very topical issue. And um, this seminar is um, a very good um, example of, um, of the major changes that have occurred in this area in the past, um, in the past two years. I would like to remind you that um, the thematic year 2009 was an expression of, um, of this attention that gave rise to a s series of uh, thematic initiatives such as the uh, 2010 Consensus Conference on, on Homelessness. Um, the current um, economic and financial crisis that has been uh, going on for, for uh, quite some time, uh, quite some time um, and the subsequent um, um, austerity and fiscal consolidation measures have nonetheless coincided with um, uh, the reinforcement of the social dimension of the EU with the entry into force of, um, of the Lisbon uh, Treaty that contains a social clause, um, with the adoption of, um, of the Europe 2020 strategy with, which has an important social dimension that is represented notably by, uh, by one of its flagship initiatives, um, the European Platform Against Poverty and Social Inclusion, um, Exclusion, but also by, by other, um, uh, other um, flagship initiatives. Um, and um, yes, this European fl Platform um, Against Poverty and Social Exclusion represents um, a complementary approach to, to the social open method, um, method of coordination, which will also give rise to, to a series of, um, of initiatives in the field of homelessness, but in a field of other social polit policies tackling um, um, the issues that um, uh, vulnerable groups are confronted with nowadays, um, nowadays in Europe. Um, and um, the Europe 2020 strategy includes, um, um, has introduced um, social innovation, or well, the concept of so social innovation, as um, an interesting and useful way to provide um, evidence-based um, methods to contribute to the reform and modernization of, um, of um, social policies, including those tackling um, homelessness. And for this purpose, the Commission has launched a um, um, number of calls for proposals for social experimentations in, in the past few years, and we will launch um, another call, um, well, in this half of, of 2000, um, 2012. Um, these um, initiatives of the Commission in you know, launching the call for proposals on social experimentations have met with, with great success. We have received many, many applications and we hope that um, we, will see, we will still receive some more. Um, also the issue of, of homelessness per, that affects particularly migrants and, uh, and mobile EU citizens has been addressed in um, a number of um, recent uh, legislative acts, such as the um, um, communication on migration, on asylum, or the communication on the um, European agenda for the integration of third country nationals that have been adopted, well, that were adopted uh, last year in, uh, in May and uh, July, respectively. And these, um, well, these communications call for um, appropriate measures to ensure 
the uh, integration and um, inclusion of, um, of third country nationals. Um, I have to say that um, homelessness, um, destitution and deprivation affect um, um, migrants and mobile EU citizens more than they affect um, other vulnerable groups because um, these categories of people lack um, an informal support networks and they face specific barriers to accessing the labor markets and the social protection system, social inclusion measures, um, um, because primarily because um, of their um, of the situation deriving from their uh, legal residence status, but also from the lack of knowledge of the host country's language, institutions, um, and uh, and legislation. Obviously, uh, migrants are even more touched, uh, even more affected by, by these, um, by these um, issues like homelessness and destitution than, uh, than the mobile EU citizens because um, uh, the EU citizens have at least the, well, have the right to, to free movement. They also benefit from um, cross-border portability of social security rights and they also have the right to, to legal residence in other EU member states. Uh, for instance, in some countries, um, migrants, especially those that are um, in an irregular situation, are afraid to, to solicit public support um, and uh, social housing and temporary accommodation um, and uh, benefits and allowances deriving from, from their situation because they fear they will be deported or uh, removed, returned to their countries of origin. In, in other European member states, um, the authorities that process requests for, for social support uh, for homelessness and, and, and allowances are required to report uh, migrants that are in an irregular situation to, um, to the immigration authorities. Um, then um, migrants, more, even more so than, um, than the EU mobile citizens, may um, uh, find themselves excluded from social protection uh, benefits um, and social access to social services probably because they, um, they are in an irregular situation or because they are in an uh, informal employment that prevents them from um, um, receiving uh, benefits when, when they lose that employment. And in the case of um, EU mobile citizens, because they find um, various barriers to, to the portability of social security benefits across uh, borders. And therefore, it is necessary to um, do a mapping exercise and to, to identify the causes of, um, of um, destitution and of homelessness in the case of migrants and, and EU mobile citizens. Uh, to identify the barriers to accessing social security benefits and, um, and uh, social protection and social services stemming from, from their, uh, uh, either from their regular situation or from the um, uh, fact that well, they are migrants and, or mobile citizens. And therefore, um, the, the Commission via the DG employment is um, currently supporting and uh, financing a study on migration, uh, mobility and, um, and destitution. We have also financed a um, study on the active inclusion of, um, of migrants that has been recently published. You can find it on, on our website as well as on the website of the Institute for Social Work, IZA. Um, in which um, which focuses on the take up of benefits by by migrants and uh, EU mobile workers, but also on um, on the um, payment of, of uh, contributions to the social protection systems of of the host countries. Uh, moreover, we intend to release in 2012, probably towards the end of the first half or maybe in the second half, early second half of 2012, 
um, follow-up report on the um, on the implementation of the active inclusion strategy that um, provides not only for um, access to to labor markets including for migrants and uh, mobile um, eu workers but also to um, access to um, social services social protection social inclusion measures and to um, minimum income support um, Yes, as the Honourable Member Cecilia Wickstrom has um, um, called on the Commission, uh, we are yes, we are working on on, on this mapping of, of homelessness, and uh, within a year and a half, we hope to to publish the the results of this extensive um, of this extensive study. We are also working on the. Um, clarification of legislation on free movement and migration. Um, for the moment, um, we work with the, with the Parliament and with the Council on a series of um, legislative proposals on uh, precisely, precisely on, these, um, on, on these issues. Um, yes, and we agree with the, uh, with the Honourable Member Daly that uh, we should um, uh, start working on the strategy on homelessness and on putting in uh, in, uh, um, in 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 practice as as soon as possible. As um, as I have um, uh, tried to explain in my brief uh, intervention, we have already made the first steps um, in in this direction, and we hope that with the support of, of the European Parliament and with the other institutional actors, we will. Um, manage to um, encourage um, the member states as well as other uh, stakeholders to to collaborate with us and with each other to el elaborate effective policies to fight um, poverty social exclusion and and hopeless and uh, homelessness um, we are also trying to promote the deepening of the mutual learning in, in the field of, um, of homelessness, but on other, on other social, um, social issues with, um, uh, with the member states. And um, we're also calling on all stakeholders to work on... Um, um, Ma on making you the best use of um, of the existing um, financial instruments such as the structural fund funds the european social funds and the european globalization funds and um, and others and now in order to uh, briefly um, answer the question regarding the criminalization of homelessness in in hungary um, well as you know the the commission is um, insisting uh, to, on, to all the member states to, to respect the Charter of Fundamental Rights and um, we're doing our utmost to, uh, to enforce it. So uh, thank you very much for, for your attention and uh, if you have questions I will be happy to, to answer to them. Later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janet Sansu. Thank you for being here, first of all. Thank you for your personal commitment. Um, I think, uh, and thank you for all uh, that is done by, by the Commission. I think that's true for uh, each of us uh, in, uh, in this room. We never do uh, enough. Uh, we should always do uh, uh, more than what we try to, to achieve. Um, I think that something is moving in the European institutions, in the Parliament, also in the Commission. At the same time, I believe that we should never underestimate, not the Parliament, not the Commission, our role and our authority, so to say. And uh, sometimes I would like to see our institutions, including the Commission, but also the Parliament, to be more assertive on this issue and more assertive on... Um, countries and specific situation where uh, rights and basic rights uh, are uh, violated. 
uh, I think that our voices is uh, probably uh, more uh, listened to than uh, than what we, uh, we we suppose. So we should be uh, out speaking about that. But in indeed, uh, thank you very much. And uh, as you can see uh, here, we just have a small. Uh, uh, number of organizations, but there is a, a huge uh, sector of the European society which is uh, working on the ground, on the field, uh, and which is uh, uh, desperately in need uh, for uh, political connections and institutional connections, and uh, uh, what the Commission can do is certainly extremely welcome. We have now limited time for additional questions, uh, please. Yes, thank you. It's for you, Mr. Sasu, and um, I would like to ask you, because I'm so, uh, first of all, we work with foreign rough sleepers in Copenhagen, we're from Project Outside, and I would like to ask you if you can give me some good advice, because I'm so lucky I'm going to talk to the Danish social minister on Friday, and she keeps on talking about that she will not do anything because the, they are not allowed to be in Denmark, and she will not do anything before you do something here on EU level. and. Uh, that talk has been going now for five years, and I can hear that you have spent a lot of money down here for five years, but the problem is increasing still. So maybe if you could be a little more concrete so we can help these people who are sleeping outside uh, in the cold for fifth or sixth year now. Thank you. Additional questions? Um, well, I agree that uh, the EU should um, should do more to tackle the, the issue of, of homelessness. But as you know, um, the um, social policies are mainly the competence of, of the member states. So what we can do is to provide support to, to the member states and to coordinate um, uh, the, the, the work that is being done by, by the member states. We can provide a forum for the exchange of good practices uh, and for mutual learning for, for member states. Um, so this is what we can do in terms of, um, of policies. Of course, we can also um, 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 uh, come up with, uh, with a, a more... Uh, uh, general policy framework or policy strategy on, on, on homelessness, but I guess that your, um, your question referred to what we can do to financially support um, fighting No, maybe more that you can make some, uh, some rules maybe for, uh, for these uh, EU citizens who are in a kind of limbo right now because nobody wants to take care of one and no, everybody says it's not my problem. So we have about four million people who live in a kind of limbo where everybody says it's not me, it's not me. Uh, well, <laughs> yes, it's not me. Yeah. <laughs> Now, I, in my presentation, I tried to present an overview of um, of the things that the DG employment is doing to tackle homelessness. So this is uh, my answer in a nutshell. Well, the fact that the social policy is a matter of. Uh, um, for, national, for member states, it is true. And we cannot actually ask uh, the Commission to do a job that member states uh, are supposed to do, and actually they are supposed to do because are the member states who refuse to give the competence to the European Union. That's the, that's the mechanism. Eh? They don't want that the social policy becomes a, a, a communitarian uh, uh, policy. Having said that, what we refuse here in the Parliament is that this is an excuse uh, for the European Union for doing nothing, which is uh, sometimes the, the opinion of some of my colleagues. And they say, well, we have no competence, why we have to waste time uh, and words and uh, uh, political energy for something that we are not supposed uh, to do? Because uh, uh, not only it is a moral duty, but actually the citizenship concept it is very much EU. EU policy, and we, we have to act. But what happens, it is what is actually happening in, uh, in Denmark, as 
many other countries that everybody gives responsibility to, to the other side. Eh? It's not me, I wait for the others, and, uh, and, and so on. But uh, as a matter of fact, everybody should take up uh, its own, uh, its own uh, uh, duty, and uh, uh, EU should flag that this must become uh, a priority, and it is a growing social phenomenon, and then member states have to act in a coordinated way, because if there is no coordination, uh, we will have the problems that has been raised this morning, uh, today at the, at the press conference, uh, uh, no standard practice, uh, and, and so on. Uh, I have to say that European money is there. It is not well used in some countries, mine, or it is not used at all, we have uh, uh, not just Italy, but certainly Italy more than other countries, a very limited absorption uh, capacity, but European money is, uh, is there. I, I think that this uh, uh, information paper uh, about this Daphne project that you uh, introduced is, is absolutely useful. It is a practical example of something that can be actually done uh, using uh, EU uh, money from the direct funds uh, from, from Daphne, but also through the indirect uh, funds uh, social uh, cohesion, structural funds, there, is, there are a lot of, uh, of uh, possibilities through the local authorities using uh, uh, European funds. Uh, please. I would like to, to suggest something, if possible. I would like everybody to read Nussbaum, which is the basis for justice. The state of action. We can find all adapted laws that uh, that we need, but if it's the planetary system that creates uh, that creates problems, how can we face things? Maybe the policymakers must uh, pose the problem differently. I would like to join Mrs. Deli in her anger and launch a and launch a call. We, if next year, on the 8th February, nothing has been done against, fo against uh, homelessness, then I think we could, should come back here if nothing has been done then. The hunger strike I just suggested it. Obviously, it would be very bad if we would have to take such measures. You have answered very well the question that was posed to the European Commission. Everybody does what he wants. There is no, no legal basis for it. But look at the climate change. At the beginning, everybody said, everybody does what he wants. But now, why? But then finally, Europe came in. And so this is the same situation here. There is no political willingness. We lack political engagement and willingness because I see what you do. The associations on the territory, they know what is lacked, they know what is needed. But now Europe needs to pose an objective, a real concrete pos objective. What hinders us? to do something for these people who are dying because of the cold. We need an urgent reunion of the member states. We need an urgent action, an urgent solution. What hinders you to do something urgently? It's just political willingness. Because when you have to hold other reunions, if, if it's about saving the Eurozone. Within three days, everything is, made, everything is put in place. And now we need an urgent reply, an urgent meeting for, to save people from dying. I have also asked it last week within Parliament. We need a resolution. There are always discussions and debates about everything, also in Strasbourg. I don't want to accumulate oral questions every six months. I don't want to pose a written question every two weeks. 
if there is no reaction, the actors and stakeholders on the territory, the volunteer people, they do something concretely, but the political basis, the political establishment does not do anything. We cannot continue to leave out the most vulnerable of our societies. I am young, and I see people my age or even children who live on the street, who are rough sleeping. I cannot support this. I cannot, I cannot accept this. And secondly, Europe is built upon solidarity. This is very clear. We cannot put this word in question. We cannot, um, we cannot criticize this word. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, and see you next time. Uh, but it is also very important to, to bring this kind of debate in our own countries, not just at the European level, because again, uh, there is uh, uh, on environment, on climate, uh, a clear competence from the European Union, uh, uh, as much as there is uh, on financial issues, and there is not on social policy. And what I'm always astonished is that in our internal debates, in our own countries, uh, social exclusion is not a topic in the political debate. We have elections now in a number of countries, and I can see that uh, there is no debate uh, on poverty, on street people, uh, etc. And uh, we should bring this to the attention of the political leaders also in our own countries. And that is a job also for the media. They have some responsibility for, for doing that, and uh, for uh, schools, universities, uh, all the institutions that are there to create uh, create uh, uh, opinions and create awareness of, uh, of the problems. Well, I think we are coming, approaching to the very end. Eh? So I, I give uh, to Frick uh, spin, spin a win. Spin a win. That's, spin a win. That's easy, no? It's good enough, yeah. Spin a win, it's good enough. <laughs> the, 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 the conclusions of our, our discussions, please, Frick. Okay, I will be very quick and concise. But first of all, a small reaction, because I, 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 it's probably a bit easy to do commission bashing, and we certainly don't want to put uh, Yunut Sasu in an impossible position. I mean, but there is frustration, it's clear, about the lack of initiative from the European Commission. And it's not possible to blame the member states any longer. There is a call for a new strategy on homelessness from the European Parliament, from the Committee of the Regions, from the Economic and Social Committee that is a representative here. There was the thematic light year on homelessness in 2009, which is a sign that the member states, represented by the SPC, the Social Protection Committee, want to work on homelessness at EU level. So what is stopping the European Commission from developing this strategy? If you tell us that there is a start of some thinking about a new strategy in the European Commission, it's already an encouragement. But please be transparent about it and work together with the stakeholders to um, develop it. And this is a message that I think you should bring to Commissioner Andor. Because of course it's the responsibility of the member states. But I thought that the European Union invented the open method of coordination a fantastic tool to overcome that problem of subsidiarity to still support the member states to do something useful. It's perfectly possible to have an EU strategy on homelessness in the framework of the open method of coordination. Our Danish colleague made an appeal for legislation. Maybe I'm wrongly informed, but I thought that the European Commission has the right to have initiative. Why not propose a piece of legislation? You can see afterwards if the Council is voting against it, but show some courage. So, Back to the theme of the, um, um, and sorry for the frustration, but I get after 10 years a little bit frustrated, I have to say. So back to the theme of the, um, the seminar today. I think we all agree that homelessness and destitution amongst EU migrants is a serious problem and growing. We have heard from a number of countries here around the table, but there is obviously more countries concerned, and FEANSA gets echoes from countries like Ireland, the Netherlands, Belgium, France, and others, that it is a growing problem. It's still small, it is solvable, so I would suggest let's try to attack it at EU level. I think that we all agree that 
the people that are destitute and homeless EU citizens in other countries have come to these countries for work reasons. And therefore, it's totally in line of the logic of the free movement legislation. They have not come to profit from the social system. They have come to work. And if we saw the ages that were presented, the average ages, it's a clear um, evidence of that. The age is between 20 and 45 or 50, working age. If, people, if homeless people would move to profit from the homeless system in other countries, I think we, should, we, would, we would have seen or we should have seen um, a lot more older people going to have an easy life in a night shelter. I think there was some agreement that there is, one of the reasons for it is that there is an absence of a European legal framework regulating economically inactive EU migration. And free movement, we agree it is a success story for the European Union, but please don't be blind for the sight, the how do you say, the shadow uh, side of that. So I think there needs to be an EU legal framework that enforces member states to guarantee access to emergency social care for all EU citizens, even if they don't have a protected uh, status. That's one thing. I think we also discussed um, um, uh, solutions. Most of us agree that for most of the people destitute, the solution is in the host country by supporting those people to find work and accommodation. I think the European Union can help member states to develop good practices in that area. It's perfectly in line with the open method of coordination. And another option for a minority, in some countries a smaller minority, in other countries less of a small minority, to go back to the country, to re reconnect the people uh, to the country. But I think we all agree that it was emphasized time and time again that it should be on a voluntary uh, uh, basis. So not following the example of France when they tried to get um, the Roma back to their country. Now, if we look at all that, I think there is a lot possible uh, um, uh, for the EU, for the European Commission to do. You could do a mapping of the problem. And I'm happy to hear that the European Commission is in the process of doing that. That's probably the first step of much more uh, to come. There is exchange of good practice. I mean, it sounds a little bit hollow, but it can actually lead um, uh, to results. Funding. I mean, Mr. Rinaldi mentioned that there is lots of funding. Yes, but let's be a little bit concrete how we can use the funding, how can we can, how do you call it, safeguard a sufficient amount of the structural funds for intervention on social inclusion issues and issues that relate to the uh, most extreme forms of uh, uh, poverty. I was thinking, it's just a small note, but I was thinking we were listening, Heather and myself, yesterday uh, uh, to a presentation of uh, somebody in the Commission working on the EURES program. I mean, if the European Commission wants to help people to move to a country for work, maybe they can help them to sustain the work and not leave them alone when they fall in destitution. Just a proposal. Um, but I think it should be useful, uh, it should be possible under the uh, EURES uh, uh, program. So that's maybe some of the conclusions I want to make. Just to uh, finish, I think that the European Commission should not, be, should not confuse actions with strategy. Of course, there's a number of actions that the European Commission is taking in the issue, on the issue of homelessness. There is very interesting research that has been done, very interesting social experimentation projects that you just uh, mentioned. Um, Europe, the Aconia, and ourselves, we're very happy to get the funding from the European Commission to be able to work. That is all fantastic, but it doesn't give us some clarity about what the European Union and the Commission is willing to do in the next 10 years. And that's what I call a strategy. So we're not unhappy with what the European Commission has done and is doing at the moment. We're unhappy with the lack of vision for the future years, the lack of clarity about uh, a strategy. But that said, I'm quite hopeful for the future. Thank you.